Hello everybody, this is Building an Empire with Python. Just want to say I love B-Sides Las Vegas. I spoke here last year on PowerShell Empire. We know the names get a little weird. We'll explain that at the end. But uh, I love this conference. I love interacting with everybody. and super stoked to be here again. So my name is Will Schrader. I don't know if anyone was in the 2 o'clock talk for Bloodhound, but I'll be brief. My handle is Harmjoy. I'm a researcher and red teamer for the Adaptive Threat Division of Barris Group. I've done a lot of offensive PowerShell, but uh, this will be one of the first talks in a bit that I will not say the word PowerShell the entire time. So if you're, if you're tired of hearing me say that, you should hopefully be happy. I'm a co-founder of a few projects, an active developer, the Veil Framework, PowerShell Empire, and this project. I'm also a, a PowerShell MVP and uh, an active PowerSplit developer. Riding on Will's coattails. <laughs> I'm Steve, uh, Steve Borsch, Barris Group. Uh, prior to U.S. Army Infantryman, kind of did a career change a few years ago. Uh, decided to go from kicking in doors to breaking into security systems. So um, I've also authored some tools, worked on egress assess, Empire, uh, some things like that, and PowerShell Empire as well. Uh, my name is uh, Alex from Deco Harvey. It is a mouthful for sure. Um, my handle is Killswitch GUI. I work for Varus Group as well. I'm a pen tester, red teamer, uh, just like these guys are. And um, a few things I've helped work on were simply email and simply template. Cool. All right. Uh, that's all out of the way. So what we're gonna, going to be talking about today. So I'm going to go go a bit over the motivation for building this project, and then five seconds or ten seconds. Python Empire is an OSX and Linux-based malware agent that it has a very similar architecture to the PowerShell Empire project. We're going to go over the we're going to go over the background of Empire, the architectural decisions, like kind of you know Rats 101, like why we built it this way. Go over some of the stagers with Steve, host and network triage with Steve and Alex, lateral movement, persistence. And, and the like, and really kind of go over how this agent can facilitate the trade craft that you might be used to on Windows, but do it instead for OSX specifically, but also a bit for Linux. It's gonna be an ongoing theme throughout the entire presentation. I'll make a few comments at the end of kind of about future plans, uh, combination of the code bases and things like that. And all throughout the presentation, we're gonna have like small demos. Instead of one 10-minute demo at the end, we're gonna break it up into like little two or three-minute chunks, so you don't have to hear us uh, just talk through slides the entire time. So why build this? So we do a lot of engagements. We do a lot of pen tests. We do a lot of red teams, um, which we kind of define as, you know, like uh, three to six week type engagements. We had a particular client or a couple of clients that started having more heavy concentrations of OSX machines in their environment. And this one particular client, they were like, well, you know, come in, do this engagement. We did the first engagement. We essentially tried to hit all the uh, like Windows virtual machines and developers and things like that because we're really heavy Windows tradecraft. We hit that and we went back. They were like super happy and afterwards they're like, well, okay, we're going to bring you in again, but you have to hit OSX. It was late last year and we we're like, oh shit, you know, like um, OSX, okay. Um, like we know a couple of things, but there, there's not nearly as much information on OSX as there is on Windows, right? It has a much smaller market share, so there's not as many attack tool sets. There's some, a few small pieces. Um, Fuzzy Knop did a great presentation in 2014. DerbyCon, if anyone saw it, I think it was red teaming back and forth five ever, where he talked about uh, some of these OSX, PostX kind of capabilities specifically. But we didn't really see any kind of complete OSX agents, right? You know, there, there weren't a huge amount of uh, possibilities for us. So over Christmas last year, I spent the entire break, rewrote a Python malware agent for this particular client, and instead of writing from scratch, I don't know Objective-C, Swift, whatever for OSX, I'm a Windows dude, so I was like, okay, there's Ruby and Python and scripting languages, like, okay, I'm just gonna go with the PowerShell Empire type architecture. We use a huge amount of the, kind of the back-end PowerShell Empire controller, which we'll go over here in a bit. You know, some of, the, some of the stuff that's out there for OSX, so even though the pen testing community does not have as many tool sets, there is obviously malicious OSX malware out there, right? Wirelurker for Trojanized applications, X, Xcode Ghost for Xcode packages, kind of originating from China, hacking team with the leak and all their source code, we got a really nice kind of view into these more advanced uh, 
na almost nation state style OSX tools. This is not nearly as good as that, obviously, because we're just a couple of dudes doing this in our spare time. Uh, but again, there has been malicious OSX tool sets out there, but there hadn't been something super open source and public and with the modular architecture that we're used to operating in as, as open source legitimate pen testers and red teamers. We're gonna, again, we're gonna touch on this throughout the entire presentation, but OSX to us at least presents a good number of challenges versus Windows. There aren't nearly as many public OSX attack tool sets because of the market share. In particular, there's a few things that are really kind of pain points for us for OSX from a pen tester perspective. Initial access vectors are, there are just not that many of them. With Windows, you have HTAs and macros and like uh, the reg, the reg SCT type stuff, you know, it seems like every few weeks there's a new access, access vector you can have for Windows uh, initial access through phishing. For OSX, there, we didn't really see many vectors like at all. So we ended up kind of creating a, a macro based approach, which afterwards some people came out of the word work and like, oh yeah, this has been public, but it just wasn't publicized. So we're not claiming we invented this stuff. We were just trying to develop solutions on the fly for engagement so we could be effective. Lateral spread is also really annoying for us. Uh, if you're Windows, you have past the hash and all this really fun stuff and domain delegated access. With OSX, you might have SSH, you might not, but other than that, it's, it's a lot more difficult for sure, and Steve will cover some of that stuff in a later section. So Brats 101, just a few of the kind of thoughts we had when we started designing the architecture of this whole project. So we want staging flexibility, and by that, we mean we want an easy way to generate a large number of stagers. Stagers, I mean the first little bit of code that's executed on a system that starts the staging process for the entire rat. With Empire, or uh, Python Empire as well as PowerShell Empire, we don't give you, unless you really want to, the entire rat in one malicious block. We have like key exchange and all this type of stuff, so you can run just a small little one-liner snippet in a variety of ways to get the entire agent staged into memory. Uh, modularity. Just like the PowerShell Empire project, you, we want people, we want to give people the ability to build their own modules. And actually, the talk right after this, uh, they're dropping some live Python Empire modules. I haven't seen them at all. They, they developed some awesome stuff. I don't actually know the contents of the modules they're dropping, so we're pretty excited. And also, we care a lot about crypto. We don't want self-signed SSL certificates to be the only thing that protects the communications for our clients' environments. And these really high security, clients, they, they care about crypto as well. So if we can demo to them, like, look, we have encrypted key exchange, perfect forward secrecy, and all this stuff to show that we thought through it, hopefully that makes them a bit more at ease. And also, I'll touch just briefly on the staging problem. Somehow, your malicious code has to get to the target. Whether you package it all up and send it to them, you know, in one initial payload, you can do that. But somehow, this code has to traverse the network to get to the client. So there's a lot of things that kind of come into play with that. So, the solution we built, Python Empire. That was our last minute, uh, now slightly regrettable naming scheme because everyone's like, Empire, Empire, like what the hell are you talking about? But, uh, you know, we thought it was clever at the time and kind of a sleep deprived and caffeine fueled uh, end of the development cycle. This is the interface. Just to kind of show you guys, it should look very familiar uh, to PowerShell Empire because it uses 95% of the same backend code base. It's a text-based driven tool. We also have a RESTful API, which I'll touch, touch in kind of right at the end, where people have started to build front-end GUIs for these types of tool sets that we're building because a RESTful API provides the ability to do so. So we're excited about the future possibilities. If anyone wants to talk about that later, we'll be out for a little bit in, in the main room and we'd love to talk shop. So the background, again, Python, pure Python-based agent. It's, uh, it's Python 2.7 and 2.6 compatible, so it'll work on most Linux systems and it will definitely work on OSX systems. This isn't just a POC tool that we're, we developed you know, a couple months ago. We used this on engagements more than once. It's been extremely effective for us, so we're happy to share it with everybody. And heavily based on the, the PowerShell Empire project. It has an asynchronous communication model, so the client will request a tasking over HTTP or HTTPS at the moment. We're hoping to incorporate more transport mechanism, mechanisms in the future. 
the server returns an encrypted blob, but you know, with this, instead of a, a, an, a, an established type of connection that's kept persistent, this is all asynchronous. So reach out, get the tasking, process it, post the results back, and you can have delay intervals anywhere from five seconds to hours. We have asynchronous, uh, and we also have Diffie-Hellman based encrypted key exchange. I won't go into all the guts of this stuff. I find it really fascinating, but I know most people don't. The, the point with this is Diffie-Hellman EKE gives us perfect forward secrecy with a different session key per client. So if instant responders image a particular box and pull out the key, they can decrypt that client's communications, but they cannot decrypt any other agent communications they see in their network. I, I think EKE is awesome. And we have a variety of post-exploitation modules, some of which we'll be covering during the presentation in depth. Module development, just like PowerShell Empire, the development for this project is extremely quick due to the modular structure and the use of a scripting language. So instead of having something completely compiled, and you're like, I want to modify X, you have to go through uh, Xcode and recompile all this stuff, and it gets pretty difficult with binary code. It's a scripting language, it's just Python. So if you want to extend something in the field, which we've done several times, it's really easy to do so if you know what you're doing. Modules here are essentially metadata containers for an embedded Python script, just like PowerShell Empire. And we have nice little options like uh, whether or not the module needs administrative access with sudo, whether it's OPSEC safe, which we care about a lot, meaning does it drop a file to disk or display something to the user? Whether or not you want to save file output to a particular format when things are, the results are kind of sent back and we, it was really kind of fun designing our own rat and building all the little things into it that we always wanted, like kill dates, working hours, like all, all those nice little options. Cool. So Steve is gonna talk about some of the stagers initial phishing access. All right, thanks Will. Uh, so stagers, Will talked about uh, getting our initial malicious uh, code execution on the target host. So that's what we're gonna talk about here. Uh, the first stager that we built uh, for operating on some of our clients were the macros. Uh, typically, we think about Windows when we think about Office macros. Uh, well, we can do the same thing for OSX targets as well. Um, Microsoft and uh, OSX have Office in them as well. Um, but we have to change how the macro works a little bit, and we'll talk about that. So this blob of text right here is a generated macro that uh, Empire creates, you give it the listener um, where it's going to call back to, and it generates this blob. This is the actual uh, macro that you stick in the Office document that you're going to send to the target. Um, if, it's kind of hard to see down here, but at the bottom, it's actually calling Python. It's taking this entire Base64 encoded blob, uh, echoing it to Python. And the reason we echo to Python is that way incident responders can't see the agent running as a process in memory. They just see Python. Um, we found out during development that just calling Python to decode the Base64 encrypted blob actually showed the entire uh, string of the agent in memory. Yeah. So we, just got like, away, we got away from that. Yeah, so you would have you know Python-C equivalent to like PowerShell-encoded command or dash C. But if you just echo components to a Python binary, it accepts anything on standard in as code and executes it. Thanks, Will. Mock code binaries, uh, mock object file format for executables. So Windows, we have executables. We can execute batch files. We can execute HTAs, um, a whole other range of executable formats. So this is what we use for OSX. And what we do is we hot patch a binary with the Empire Stager. Uh, it actually uh, includes the entire Python library uh, interpreter. Uh, we use that actually um, on engagements. Um, client can have like Casper, Jamf, and they can push our binary out to the target machines if they don't actually want to go through a phishing exercise. You can just push it out, execute it on the remote system, and get your callback. We also have Dilib hijacking, much like DLL hijacking in Windows. Uh, this research uh, was based off of Patrick Wardle. Uh, he has a great uh, PDF right there all about it. I won't get into the details too much because it's a bit complicated, but it's basically abusing search order loading. If a program wants to load a Dilib or something like DLL, it has to go in an order of directories to find that, and we can abuse that. 
Um, we also use this as a method of persistence in Empire. This is the hijack scanner module. Uh, this was also based off of Patrick Wardle. What this does is it scans much like if you've used PowerUp in uh, Windows. It scans for possible hijack locations. You have our path, uh, which loads load order hijacking like DLLs and Windows. We also can look for uh, weak dialibs, um, which means that that dialib doesn't actually exist in the directory. Then if we create one, put it in that directory, when that program is launched, it'll launch our stager instead. So we can uh, find the hijackable point, and then when, with Empire, we can create a hijack module, uh, run it on the target system, and when that is executed, we get our callback. So at the top here, you see a little bit of green text, kind of fuzzy, I'm sorry about that, but that's the actual agent coming back. What we did in this case, we installed Xcode on the target system, and Xcode by default has a, a weak dialib problem, so we're able to hijack that. When the user double clicks on Xcode and launches the program, it launches our stager and then launches Xcode. And cool. we're just gonna spool up a quick demo on phishing with the uh, Office macro. I think it's pretty cool. We have you guys probably won't be able to hear it, but, oh, one second. Okay, here we go. I know the text is a little bit small, but okay, we're starting up Python Empire. We're gonna create a listener. Just like PowerShell Empire, you have your working hours, default delay, redirection, loss limit, those types of things. Uh, these options are what are patched into the initial agent as soon as an agent is staged from this particular listener. We're gonna create a macro for this listener. This is, uh, this is, the, oh. I just wanna talk about, okay. you, so an option right here, set little snitch to false. Uh, on an engagement, we found out that uh, some of our target users were using little snitch, and that actually got us burned because we launched our agent on the remote system. As soon as it tried to call out, it alerted the user that our agent was calling out through Python and they alerted their IR team. So what we found out was that a lot of the developers don't use Little Snitch, and we entered in uh, an option to turn that check off. So it checks to see if Little Snitch is running. If Little Snitch is running, the agent just dies, so they won't call back. Yep, that pretty way, useful. if we're on a red team and we're trying to be stealthy, uh, we can get by that protection. Again, that is not an exploit of Little Snitch, it's just a check and then killing the agent. It, it keeps it from staging. So uh, here, we're gonna take that macro, Paste it into an Excel notebook. I'll speed up just a little bit in the interest of time. You know, paste it into just like Windows, right? Paste it in. You see what's echoed to Python. I'm gonna open this. Click Enable Macros because I totally trust this whatever totally not phishing email that we that I sent myself. And at that moment, as soon as that Enable Macros is clicked, an agent will be staged. That was kind of cool. Looking. Macros are not just a Windows problem. Cool. Now, Alex is going to talk a bit about post triage. Appreciate it. Uh, just like on the Windows side, uh, the first things ge we generally go through are some type of situational awareness, uh, maybe some host surveying scripts. So we're going to get into that part. Um, obviously, one of the first things that generally take place on an engagement uh, after doing some basic situational awareness is we want to know if we can escalate. Uh, there's specific modules. Uh, within Empire that are obviously going to require an elevated context. So on the Mac side, uh, you're not going to see as many, let's say, privilege escalation uh, vulnerabilities out there. And if they are, they're generally updated pretty decently fast. So just like on the Windows side, on our tradecraft where we generally have to either find passwords, uh, maybe GPP or some other type of like share or uh, log on script or, or any type of like escalation method we can go through using power up. Uh, we would see the same kind of methodology applied on the OSX side. Um, I don't know how many OSX users are out here or Mac users, but on just a show of hands, how many of you guys actually run as admin on your OSX box? 
Okay, so few, few out there. Um, some people do separate privilege, uh, you know, uh, privilege separation properly. Some don't. Uh, on the development side, as developers, obviously, in an organization where you're installing, uh, pushing code, and and doing these types of activities, you would often see users as a local admin. Um, so that that kind of gives us somewhere to start with. Uh, in this case, we have uh, two different ways that we're actually going to talk on. There's a few different um, privilege escalation checks you can go through, uh, but two that have been really successful for us are prompting. Uh, in OS Script, you can actually call an application to prompt the box. So we've used this method uh, on in live engagements to gather credentials. Uh, so the, the first one is the Mac app prompting, so you can tell the, let's say, app, the App Store to open up an application saying, hey, I need your password. Please trust me and give it to me. Um, the second one that we came up with uh, was the alley-oop method. Just like on Windows where you can pump a UAC uh, bypass, a, uh, you can do this same exact method, uh, but there's an interesting uh, caveat to this. On the OSX side, there's a tool called security. Uh, with the security tool, you can force an unlock of the keychain. So using this method, you can prompt the screensaver, force the user to go to the screensaver, not allow them to exit out, take the password, check it against the keychain. If it doesn't unlock, you're not going to get through. It'll say, please enter your password correctly. If you do enter it correctly, it will unlock the keychain, and the logic will basically allow you to log back into the Windows box, uh, back into the, the OSX box. So that's kind of mean. Uh, definitely not OPSEC safe, but you can gather credentials this way in an evil fashion. Um, and once those credentials are gathered, just like you would potentially elevate on the Windows side, uh, you could do the same thing with the pseudospawn to get a root context agent. Uh, agent. So here's a uh, horrible, horrible screenshot. So it just sadly didn't come in well. Um, but at the top, you're basically, uh, you can actually see right at the top, it actually tells you the text return was password one, two, three, four. That was with the basic one. And then actually on this, we'll see in the demo as well, we see two bad passwords entered and then obviously the correct password, which unlocked the keychain. And uh, that's just a, kind of a small example of that taking place. So once you have your password, uh, generally developers are inside an internal environment. They might have tons of different resources that they have access to. They might have a password uh, for Citrix, and they might have a password for uh, an employee portal that we need to get access to. Uh, they usually use some type of password storage. Uh, it's too easy to just use the building keychain. Unfortunately, that building keychain uh, originally had some issues with where it stored the master key in memory. So we actually ported over, uh, well actually Will ported over a, a full port of it um, from C and was actually able to implement it in Python and we we're basically able to decrypt uh, the key store in memory using, um, using Yoso's uh, POC code, which is really cool, but it only applies to OSX Yosemite. So that's kind of, kind of like a, a hard point. So while most of us like update as normal users, as you would see in a Windows environment, you're, you're still seeing people in Windows 7, let alone you're still possibly seeing Windows XP boxes out there. So while you would think as a normal OSX user, you might be upgrading on a consistent basis and this might not apply to you, we will still see this. Um, and the next one would be the uh, keychain dump in, or chain breaker. We actually did a full port of that as well. That allows for a master password or just a standard password that you gathered, and you're able to uh, basically dump the entire keychain right inside the agent in memory. Uh, the next thing, obviously, hash dumping. While on the OSX side, the hashes are quite strong, uh, they use quite a cipher to basically build this hash, and it could take some time, but we do get lucky. And one reason why you would want to do a hash dump is in a corporate environment, you may see built-in accounts uh, that basically are used for remote administration. And we'll talk a little bit about this more uh, on the SSH side. Just a quick example of uh, us just dumping some hashes in the Hashcat ready format so you can easily crack them. Um, just as on the Windows side, I'm sure a lot of you uh, have used the uh, the capability of key logging. It's, it's fruitful. Uh, we generally can collect a ton of information, whether it be passwords in the background, just keep it rolling, rolling as the agent's going all day. You can gather all types of information that may be able to help you in post-exploitation or uh, potentially gather credentials, like let's say from a putty session or something of the sort. Um, and this actually is implemented from the MSF side 
and it is a full port uh, and it actually uses Ruby. Hopefully in the future, um, we'll be making a uh, progression to, to move it to full Python version. And of course, our screenshots. Um, definitely helpful uh, for identifying what the user's up to for situational awareness methods. Uh, quick note, uh, we do support two different screenshot modules. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. The first one is the native, this built-in screenshot tool, uh, which is a command line option which will output to a file. And then we also use a pure Python version of it using the Quartz APIs call, which is uh, implemented in Python. So, Say again? Uh, which one? I actually don't know that answer to that one. I would have to get back with you, so I would not be giving you correct uh, false information. But I, every time I've done it, I've never got the sound. Um, as I was saying before, uh, the environment can dictate heavily on what tool set you use. If you're in an environment, uh, like we've seen before with Carbon Black, with HIPS and devices, they will catch these built-in methods and you could potentially get flagged very easily in an environment that's potentially being monitored. So that's something that you have to identify in the beginning of the host survey of what tool sets that you're willing to use uh, so you don't make the mistake of using the built-in screenshot as well as PB copy uh, for a clipboard. Um, and this actually leads us into clipboard theft, uh, a really solid way of potentially uh, grabbing passwords from, uh, let's say, like a LastPass instance where they're using copy and paste uh, consistently. Cool thing about this is you can basically set it up on a timed interval, let it run for about an hour, uh, and you can gather all the credentials that you need while they're doing the work. And this is also, like I mentioned before, uh, this could also be signatured uh, from the PB copy command line version. Just a small example of it actually taking place in just different time stamps. Cool. All right, demo now, time. Yeah, now we're going to do, Alex is going to talk through a quick demo on host-based collection. Yeah, so we're just going to go through a few of the three of the actual things we just talked about. Uh, just like I, I want to actually show you this one because it's quite interesting, which is the screen server alley-oop. Um, I'm actually just going to set this uh, to a small X account, um, which you can specify so you don't force the user to consistently like go for 15 times straight, uh, depending on what you would feel comfortable doing. As you can see, it actually brings up the screensaver to the person. It's not the same exact login prompt, but it may be trick. It may trick them, but it will definitely force them to potentially give you their credentials. Uh, it does lock the keychain, so when the user comes back in, for any application using that keychain, they may actually have to go back and unlock the keychain. Once credentials are uh, actually gathered, I, for the sake of time, I, missed, I actually removed the pseudo spawn, but I'm actually changing my agent over to, the, uh, to a, uh, a different agent that's on my secondary box, and I'm actually going to use a collection module for gathering um, uh, for the keychain that we talked about before. In this case, it's a uh, 10.11 OSX instance, so I'm not going to use the keychain dump, but I'm using the chain breaker module, which allows me to dump the uh, passwords, uh, basically forensically sound target side. And again, with that, the general tradecraft is prompt the user for the password, use that to then respawn a high integrity or sudo agent, so you can do the interesting post exploitation options or uh, effects like hash dumping. So in a second here, we should hopefully get some credentials back. Can you see the OPSEC check? You know, so we're doing things that may or may not prompt the user or modify the system. So it's just a nice little reminder. Uh, once it comes back, it should spit out um, all the actual private keys, certificates, passwords, the whole shebang. And this actually works for not only the login keychain, but also the system keychain for messages, for the iMessage and um, Yahoo accounts and all that stuff. So that's quite cool uh, capability of this. Uh, once passwords are gathered, uh, we know we have a, a proper password. Remember, if you do a pseudo spawn and you mess up the password, you could potentially be flagging. So just keep that in mind. So I like not, to actually not test that any this. Of us have ever done that. That's a really cool um, like thing about the keychain is you can actually test it against the keychain and it does generate a log, but it's not generally. Um, uh, signature on. And this is actually just a quick hash dump like we talked about before, outputting. And uh, this is actually the end of the demo. Cool. You're up next. So with that hash dump, what we, what we did on a client engagement was dump the hashes, 
crack the password, and since it's in a corporate environment, they used the same password and had SSH enabled on all of the hosts. So we were then able to laterally spread to every host. We can get into network situational awareness. What do we do once we're on the host? Uh, what's around us? What can we see? What can we do? And yes, OSX is on the domain too. Uh, in our engagements, we found that uh, admins need to admin. Uh, they need to enforce corporate policy, be a group policy. They have to manage their resources, their users, objects, uh, advertise resources such as printers. And they benefit from the single sign-on uh, access to Active Directory uh, through Kerberos. It's pretty easy to set up. I'm just showing a picture of the directory utility in OSX and how it attaches to the domain. Um, you see the option for allow administration by, typically it's domain admins and enterprise admins. If you found other users in there, maybe you could start targeting them. OSX and LDAP. OSX has a, and most Linux distributions have a tool built in called LDAP search. This is what we use in Empire to bind to Active Directory and then perform the search that we're trying to do and get the data back. This bottom line here is just a quick way to find out where the uh, domain uh, controller is in, or LDAP server is in the network. So uh, how many people have used PowerView? PowerShell PowerView, awesome, good to see. You guys don't count. You're all on our team. <coughs> so we wanted to port some of those features of PowerView over to the Empire uh, Python version as well. Because even though we're operating in an OSX environment, Active Directory can provide us with a lot of information, perhaps um, what computers to target next, what users to target next. Uh, we talked about Bloodhound finding, um, finding paths. So we're going to go along that that route to find our t next targets with uh, a PowerView style. Unfortunately, there's a caveat to this. It does create a logon entry in uh, Event Viewer for every time an LDAP connection connects to Active Directory. Some of the things we've ported over, get computers, tell us what's, what computers are on the network, uh, what domain controllers are on the network, our file servers, those might be good places to uh, hide because they have high uptime. Group memberships, uh, group members, what groups are out there. Uh, a lot of times stuff are nested in OUs. Get user information actually just grabs all the information for a specific user. And we can list out all of the users in Active Directory as well. One thing that we found that um, we haven't been able to do yet is enumerate session data remotely from OSX. So unlike if you saw the Bloodhound stuff earlier where we could figure out who's logged in where, we don't have that ability in Empire right now. If any of you know how to do that, come see me. <coughs> so this is a shot of PowerView OSX style. Basically, we're doing a situational awareness, um, trying to get the computers that are in Active Directory. We set our bind name. This time we're going to use uh, the user jfrank at hackme.com. Of course, he's a manager, so his password is management for life. And the LDAP address, that's a domain controller, we're going to execute and it pops out just a nice list of all the computer objects that are in Active Directory, all from OSX. Overpass the hash, uh, this is some pretty slick research done by uh, Gentil Kiwi and ObscureSec. And then we ported uh, that over a tweet from uh, the guy passing the hash. He actually did this in OSX and then we figured out we can port this into our empire. Uh, basically, what this allows us to do is if we grab hashes on the domain, we can upgrade those to Kerberos tickets and then authenticate in anywhere in the domain with that hash without having the password. Some of the utilities that are uh, with Kerberos are knit, klist on the target to see what uh, Kerberos credentials exist on that target. And then you can use kdestroy if we want to remove any credentials from the target site. Ouch. All right. This fuzzy blob is uh, overpass the hash. Basically, we have a uh, NT hash that we found on the network. We run overpass the hash. It generates us a Kerberos ticket, and then we can LS the domain controller. Cool. Now Steve is going to talk through a cool little demo with some domain enumeration. This will be the, the last demo for the talk. So we 
we've got our Empire server running. Uh, we've got one listener, one agent currently active. You can see it's on uh, a Mac box internal IP address. The user, J Frank. We're going to use a module uh, to pull out. We're pulling out here. Get OUs, I believe. So there's a list. If you tab complete through here, everything is tab completable. It'll list what's next. Uh, we're going to do group members because we're going to find uh, who the domain admins are. We want to know where our domain admins are so we can start targeting them. Enter our authentication stuff to bind with LDAP search. Execute, and then it pulls back all the users of the domain administrator group. All from OSX, which is pretty cool. Now I think it's the OUs. Now we're going to get on to enumerating OUs. A lot of times uh, there's some juicy information in there. All right, good. Thought we were wigging out. Same thing. We want to use module. It's tab completable. We start typing situational awareness, tab complete out, and pull out information for the uh, OUs in the Active Directory schema. So now we have an OU for domain controllers, two service account OUs, and the IT admin OUs. So then we can take that information and perhaps start enumerating further uh, to gain some more situational awareness on where we want to go next in the network. Still me. All right, cool. Uh, lateral movement. We started this off by uh, prefacing that lateral movement is hard on the OSX side and Linux side. Windows, we have great tools like Pass the Hash, uh, WMI, we can PS exec. WinRM if it's enabled. We can remote desktop and just log right in if we need to. Uh, OSX disappoints us a lot on this front. There's typically SSH, and for most standalone systems, SSH is disabled by default. I know a lot of you are nodding your heads on that one. But in a corporate environment, admins got an admin, so they typically have SSH enabled. There is a WinEXE package through Homebrew but on a client engagement, we're not going to install stuff um, and you know, enter more vulnerable services on a target host if we can keep from it. So it would be nice if we can port this over. We've been working on it, but haven't had any success yet to uh, have a WinEXE uh, type thing to do past the hash on the OSX side. Uh, hopefully we'll have that in the future. We do have Empire modules. We actually have an SSH launcher module. So what it'll do is authenticate to the remote system It'll run Python in memory with our uh, launcher string, call back, grab our stager, and execute it in memory on the remote host. Uh, we also have an SSH uh, command where we can run a command on the remote system and then just get the output back. So if you just wanted to check kernel version, do you name tech A or something like that, you could run that and then get the information back all through Empire. Web service exploitation, we've actually used this to pivot to the Windows side from the OSX side. Uh, one example of that is to exploit JBoss, my favorite thing ever. And we can pass that exploit to an Empire server, uh, PowerShell Empire. So up here we've loaded up the um, JBoss exploit module. And what that does is abuses the JBoss flaw in the JMX invoker servlet. And instead of executing Python on the remote system because it's running Windows, it executes our stager that we loaded up for PowerShell Empire, and we get a callback and now have pivoted to the Windows side. So we're starting to get into mixed environments, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end and what we're going to do to fix that problem. There you go. Staying on the box. Alex. Yep, so the next obvious, uh, you know, progression in, a, in an oper operation is to potentially install persistence. So at this point, you've gathered all your credentials you need. You've gathered all the elevated context you need. Now you just need to know how to, to stay overnight. Um, just like you would with a Mac, they're often, they're often laptops. So persistence turned out to be a really critical thing for us. So on the Windows side, there is so much research out there, and there are so many places to hide. Uh, the registry itself, uh, I don't know if anybody truly understands it. Um, 
there's tons of research on WIMI, DLL hijacks, uh, backdoor accounts, startup folders. There's tons of ways to go about staying. But also on this front, OSX uh, actually surprised us quite a bit. Uh, there's a few really popular public you know, uh, persistence methods out there, um, mainly because it is, at the end of the day, a Nix device. Uh, so you can use cron tabs. They have their own built-in login hooks, Damien's, dial-up hijacking. All these can be really used and effective on engagement. Uh, the first one we'll start with is login hooks. Login hooks are something um, Mac developers uh, in place I think it was almost in 10.1 or something of the sort. Uh, it's actually technically now deprecated as in its unsupported functionality. Uh, some of the reasons why you may not want to use this is the fact that it is blocking. So if you fail or if your persistence module fails to execute, you could potentially stop the user from logging in. Uh, the one reason why this may be successful for you is let's say you don't have root access yet, maybe staying in user context is the way to go. Uh, so in this case, uh, any user or any user on the box can be applied a login hook. Uh, another unfortunate con about this is you can only have one login hook per user. So if that's already being used, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, the next thing that uh, Steve actually used quite often was cron tabs. Uh, in case you want a beacon every hour, well, you can make that happen, no problem. Uh, so same as you would uh, with any other one, you can set up an Apple script, binary, uh, or just even a Bash or Python script, and you can have it execute right from the cron tab itself. Timed execution of payload, and it's great for continued access in case they're restarting consistently or sleeping the box, um, and in case your agent dies, and there may be bugs out there, so you never know what's going to happen. Um, uh, the next one is launch daemons. Um, this, is, this, does, this does require root, obviously. Uh, but there, we'll talk about this in a second. There is potential for user context as well. Um, the interesting thing about launch daemons is they're started during system startup before the login prompt is presented, actually. Uh, so inetd actually starts these up. Uh, there are a plist file that is then taken through key values and executed. So in this case, you basically can set up a, a couple different cool keys out there. You can basically give it a start interval. You can keep it running. So in case that plist file actually, uh, daemon's actually stopped, it will actually restart itself. Think like just like a Windows service um, in this case. Uh, so it'd be like an auto start per se. Um, so that's a really cool benefit of these. And there's also potential for us to uh, move over onto user context side. Uh, we're using launch agents. Um, and the cool thing is, as I talked about before, if the system's taxed and login hooks fail, you could potentially lock a user out. Uh, with this, it doesn't have that, um, that, that potential con, um, but it will basically stay, uh, it'll basically launch once a system is, has enough resources to launch your daemon in that case. So that's, that's quite cool. Obviously, uh, like we talked about before, uh, Packer Wardle uh, did this great research on the, the hijacking dialibs. Um, it's something that we've used a few times and I've tested uh, a couple times, uh, but this can also be deployed for uh, a more stealthier version of persistence, of course, but the only obvious um, concern is that it's only when you start that application is when you're gonna get that agent back. So that's something you have to keep in mind. As we talked about before, there's the scanner, but there's also the crate hijack module, which actually goes through um, all the headache of actually generating the module, uh, patching it, and then actually deploying and overwriting and creating the secondary pass uh, for the follow-on so the program does launch successfully after you've uh, hijacked the uh, dialib. Um, so I'll speak just a quick second. I know we're about out of time. Future plans for the project. Everyone's like, well, Empire, Empire, PowerShell Empire, whatever, what does this mean? We're going to combine both code bases within the next few weeks. So we'll have one command and control platform that allows you to attack Windows systems and OSX systems. And we'll have some of those nice bits that Steve talked about, about passing agents between the two and kind of that cross-platform attack kind of approach. That'll be much, much nicer. We also really want to get SOX pivoting in. That's one of our biggest to-dos. We'll see if Alex stops being lazy and actually finishes all the code. But uh, it's a... Uh, it's, a, it's been a really fun project. We've had a blast doing it. The code's been out there for a couple uh, couple months. It's on GitHub. We forgot to put this up there. GitHub yeah. slash adaptive threat slash EMPYRE. If you just search for the project name, you should be able to find it. We also have a large number of blog posts that talk about usage, phishing. We have a ton of documentation on this stuff. So with that, thank you.
And are there any questions? There's, there's one actually, one thing I want to note before we get too crazy in the questions. Um, he talked about the fact that it's OS X and, um, oh. and Windows. Uh, we've actually successfully, I've actually got to successfully use this on a Linux Red Hat installation, and that's why we actually went back to 2.6. So this is truly not only just OS X and uh, Windows, this can actually be deployed in an, an agent scenario where you need yeah, Linux box. Use it in, in cloud environments and everything. Yes? What's required on the Linux side? What so the question is, what's required on the Linux side? What dependencies? The core agent is 2.6 compatible, so you need at least Python 2.6, but otherwise every single component of the core agent depends on the standard Python library, so the standard lib. There's, uh, you don't have to install any packages, you know, whatever else, it's everything that uh, automatically comes with the stock installations for 2.6 and 2.7. Yes? Can we use Python? Sorry, what was the question? Or, actually, can you, can you use the microphone no, real quick? Use microphone. Yeah, sorry. So can you compile your framework with Cython? With Cython. Can we compile the framework with Cython? I, I haven't looked into that. Have, have you guys, have we touched that yet? No. no. Because we want to keep this like non, like you don't have to compile it because it runs on Linux as is. Um, we don't support running on OS X, like launching the, the server on OS X uh, as well. A lot of people have asked us that. But we, we keep it as an open framework, uh, haven't compiled it that way. Yep, so we don't have it now, but uh, if, if you would like to try to do that pull request, that would be awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, uh, are you aware that you can uh, dump, dump anything about your uh, uh, gadget credentials? Are you guys aware that you can dump uh, Wi-Fi passwords and plain text? You might want to add that on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's that's actually in the system uh, keychain file. Uh, that ca the chain breaker file actually the chain breaker uh, module, not the not the key dump uh, exploitable one, um, that actually does dump. You can actually pass a, a specific path for the keychain, and it will, you can actually dump the system uh, keychain and get Wi-Fi passwords. Yeah, but you can actually do it without having to, uh, to get uh, into the full keychain. Oh, oh okay. I, we, yeah, we definitely. Know, we love, should talk out there. Right? Yeah, we should definitely talk. Quite interesting. Yes. Any other questions? Just go up to the microphone, please. Um, you mentioned Patrick Borden's uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. um, he also wrote Knock Knock, which yes. uh, yeah. um, like, uh, goes through everything that's in launch agents and all that jazz to show things that are being persistent. Does right. If we're, if we're on an engagement, you asked if uh, Knock Knock is installed, right? Well, and I mean, yeah, I was about to. Oh, go right If Knock Knock's installed, does it show up your shit? Yes. Cool. Uh, knock knock will show the persistence modules that we have uh, currently. Yep. If we're on an engagement and knock knock is installed, maybe we disable it first. <laughs> if we have the access to do so. I mean, how is knock knock installed? It's just right. We'll get rid of it or move it or hide it for the time being. <laughs> it depends if you're on a red team or what your scope is. What can you do on that? Yeah, no, is that, do you have ways of evading this? Uh, if knock knock is run with the persistence installed, it will detect it. I guess at the end of the day, you just have Mostly, to f find a new method. Oh. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. We do too. Yeah. 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 I guess at the end of the day, you have to develop something to just that's not in his tool set. Great. Thanks. Hmm? Thank you. On the, on the Linux side, um, you know, a lot of stuff you showed was passwords. passwords. Yep. What modules do you have for similar on the Linux side? So the question is, what types of modules do we have on the Linux side? So the framework was originally built for a couple of clients and engagements that were, that were OSX specific. So that was where our focus was to kind of get everything done. We really want to expand the Linux side instead of just the OSX side. And Most like of the stuff's OSX. Sorry? Most of the stuff's OSX. Uh, the majority of it is OSX. But we are, one of our goals in the next few months is to expand the Linux post-exploitation. For example, if you stay in this room for the next presentation, I believe they're dropping some Linux type uh, OSX post exploitation modules, and I'm hoping they'll do a pull request in in the next few weeks. Yeah, I think we have four modules right now. Um, just to quickly list them off, we have the hash dump pillage user, uh, the Linux privx checker, and the Unix privx checker, and also a uh, pure in memory PCAP sniffer. Yep. Yes. So you guys mentioned you're looking at different CNC methods. I'm wondering if that's something, like A, what you're looking into, and B, if that's something you have a hard time with, or if you find that HTTP usually works and it's not a problem. 
Yeah, so one of our goals with both the, the first thing, the next week, we want to combine PowerShell Empire and Python Empire into one framework. And after that, one of the goals right after that is to expand and modularize the command and control components for both projects. So we want to build the architecture that you could easily build a module to drop in. Cool. Yeah. All right. I think that's about it. We'll be out here for about uh, 10, 20 minutes if you guys want to have a few more questions. Thank you. Thank you.